And I'm back with presidential candidate Gary Johnson. Governor, it's now time to take some questions. Take some questions. All right. Seat's getting hot. And we, all, we have a long line of people who want to ask you questions. <laughs> Sir. Hi, I'm Eric Spitz, former owner of the Orange County Register and currently managing director at Mercury Public Affairs. And I have a question about what happens if you don't win. So when Donald Trump was asked what happens if he doesn't win, he said it would be all a mistake and a waste of time. When Bernie Sanders is asked when he's, what happens if he's not going to win, he talks about all the positive energy that he moved forward and some of the issues. What are the three issues that if you don't win, you hope to leave your mark on the election by bringing them up? Oh, I would like to think that it would be smaller government, uh, that there is a benefit to smaller government. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, there will be a benefit talking about individual freedom and liberty and always come down on the side of choice. And then I hope there will be a benefit to really being skeptical when it comes to our military interventions that have made things worse, not better. And I also like the fact that during our show, you mentioned you were, if you don't win, you'll be doing some super athlete stuff. So there's actually life after politics. <laughs> I kind of like that. There's life after politics. Good news, bad news. Uh, I might be elected next president of the United yeah, States. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Governor, um, quick question. I, I used to work oh, I'm in sorry, Say who you are. I apologize. Claire Venegas, former executive director of the Lincoln Club. Uh, now work in healthcare, actually. We operate uh, medical clinics here in Orange County. My question to you is this. Um, as a traditional libertarian, I'm assuming that you're pro-choice when it comes to the abortion issue. Um, but you ha we have a situation where entities like Planned Parenthood are being funded to the tune of half a billion dollars in taxpayer funding. What would you do as president um, reg with regard to taxpayer funding of abortion, but also health care mandates where, where businesses, business owners who's uh, maybe personally morally opposed to abortion are being required to c provide that type of coverage? What would you do as a libertarian president? Well, um, I am looking to get uh, elected president of the United States and uh, first 100 days, uh, I, myself and Bill Weld, we are going to submit a balanced budget to Congress. Now that's a 20% reduction in all funding. I'd like Republicans uh, to, uh, to be a part of that and to recognize that we absolutely need to reduce the size of government. But that doesn't mean to abolish the funding to Planned Parenthood. 20% uh, reduced funding to Planned Parenthood? Yes, along with 20% reduction uh, with regard to everything else. So uh, you would, uh, so it's a, it's a financial issue. It's not a principle. What about the idea of an employer being forced to, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, this obviously I think the reference would be to uh, uh, the, the nuns, you know, uh, and, these, and the Catholic-run hospitals and this kind of thing being forced to do things that they would not, uh, that they say their religion prevents them from Well, doing. There, there's always two sides to that equation, and it, it's, it always boils down to the legislation also, and the two sides to the equation are the employer uh, may not want to offer that sort of coverage, but then there's the person who's being covered that may want that sort of coverage, and in the whole name of equality and non-discrimination, I mean, the devil is in the details, but I'm going to come down on the side of a person being able to make their own choices and that uh, I'm going to come down on the side of not discriminating against anybody. So what about the person who doesn't want to cater a gay wedding, for example? Should the state force them to do that? To cater the gay wedding? I, I think that uh, right now that is coming under the guise of religious freedom when really what it is is it's a guise to just discriminate, to be able to discriminate against the LGBT community. I think that religious freedom is a, is a black hole, that discrimination should not be allowed. After the Civil War, uh, blacks were discriminated against on the guise of religious freedom. Mm -hmm. Claire, did you have a follow-up or? I think it's pretty clear. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, I'm Alex Wilson, Governor Johnson. It's great having you here in the studio today. I'm a sales assistant at KDOC TV, and I loosely consider myself a libertarian. Um, not on all issues, though, which I think you would probably consider a good thing that, you know, I don't align myself with one party or another. You know, I think that's something we need in this country. 
Uh, my question for you is how would a libertarian government or you as president address climate change? Um, specifically, you know, how would we curb emissions when there's really no incentives, incentives for a free market to do so? Actually, uh, so, so I support the EPA. I think the EPA comes under the heading of protecting us against polluters. And But for the EPA, we would have uh, pollution, pollution being a bad thing uh, health safety-wise in this country. I think a great example of the free market coming to bear when it comes to the environment, uh, the idea being we as consumers want less carbon emission, we as consumers have, price, have, have driven the price of coal so low uh, that all marginal coal assets have basically been bankrupted. All coal has been bankrupted uh, within the last uh, year, all publicly traded companies. Uh, yet 37% of the coal uh, of the electricity grid is driven by coal. Uh, but that coal now is coming from those non-marginal assets, Wyoming as an example, where coal can actually be even sold at these low prices and, and there be a profit from it. But even with the low price of coal, historic lows, $9 a ton, natural gas right now is even cheaper. So there are no coal plants that are going to be built because why would you build a coal plant if it's going to cost more than natural gas. So a great example of the free market actually at work uh, bringing about a cleaner uh, environment. Uh, EPA needs to set scientific standards with regard to emissions and I'm open to looking at uh, the notion that uh, cap and trade uh, may in fact be a fair proposition uh, and that it wouldn't be an increase in taxes and that it would not be a loss uh, in American jobs. What about nuclear energy? Well, nuclear f free market. Uh, nuclear energy, nothing is coming online because the costs are so out the roof. I do believe it is a safe source of uh, energy and that uh, with, uh, with the technological innovations uh, that have transpired that haven't actually been put into practice because we haven't built any of these plants, that would be an exciting prospect, but right now natural gas is running so far under all these other prospects that from a free market standpoint, it's not going to happen. Natural gas for a long time uh, in the future, and that of course ultimately um, arguably gets supplanted by clean energy, uh, solar. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? How do you feel about the government subsidies uh, for, the, for clean energy, for solar and wind and all that? Well, the, the problem with subsidies and, uh, you know, right along with subsidies for, uh, for wind and solar, we have subsidies for uh, ethanol. And uh, by all reckoning, uh, that's a prospect that uh, uh, uses more energy than less energy and uh, that that subsidy should be eliminated. I hate to pick and choose when it comes to subsidies, but if I were to pick and choose when it comes to subsidies, uh, solar makes a lot more sense than uh, ethanol. I'd like to get rid of the uh, subsidy when it comes to ethanol. Right. To me, it doesn't make any sense at all. Alex, do you have any another So thought? is it fair to say that you consider the EPA to be, uh, so to speak, an example of good government? Uh, an example of a basic government function that protects us against individuals, groups, corporations, foreign governments that would do us harm. Pollution does us harm, and EPA really a fundamental role of government. Thank you, Governor. Do we Thank have you. another question? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, thank you very much for coming to speak with me today. My name is Adam Jacobs. I'm an 18-year-old resident here in Orange County, and I've lived here almost my entire life. Uh, my parents sent me to a private school because they didn't really believe in a lot of what public education is doing, even though Orange County has great schools. They also wanted me to have a nice religious uh, background. Now, that said, I'm doing an internship right now with the California Policy Center, and I've done a lot of research on education in America, and Republicans want to shift power often times away from the federal government and toward local and state governments when it comes to education. Democrats want to set up a giant sort of federal system to deal with all these problems. 
when it comes to education funding, if we're going to shrink government, do you think that the federal government should have a lot more to say about education or that we should leave it to the states? Uh, as governor of New Mexico, I was more outspoken than any governor in the country regarding school choice, uh, believing that we should bring competition to public education. So for six straight years in New Mexico, when I was governor, I proposed a full-blown voucher system that I think would have brought competition to public education. I th would like to abolish, if I could wave a magic wand, uh, I'm not going to get elected dictator, I'm not going to get elected king, uh, but uh, count on me to sign any legislation that abolishes any federal agency. But at the top of that list is the Federal Department of Education, which essentially gives each state 11 cents out of every school dollar that every state spends. But California, come on, think about this for a second. You send Washington 13 cents. It goes through the bureaucratic wash and dry cycle, and it comes back as 11 cents. How do you like that? Mm -hmm. And then not only that, but the federal government says that to get your 11 cents, you need to do A, B, C, and D, mandating how California administers, uh, delivers education. They tell you, you got to do A, B, C, D, and it costs you 15 cents. So there's another four cents gone by the wayside. Just leave it with California. I'm going to assume California is going to do a much better job than the federal government. Okay. Do you have a follow-up? Now, that said, uh, there are, and education is very important to me, as well as one area of education, sexual education, in which the federal government doesn't trust states to carry out those mandates, and that's why those mandates exist. Uh, though I consider myself on your side and definitely on this argument of the federal government, do you think that it's appropriate that certain uh, federal authorities and certain federal actions be taken to ensure that everybody in America gets proper sexual education? No, I don't. Uh, I think the federal government exists to really make sure that constitutionally uh, that, that we are a, a country governed by laws, that being the U.S. Constitution, and the federal government has a role to make sure that no one is uh, discriminated against, uh, that no constitutional violations uh, are, are, are occurring with states, but I don't think that uh, sexual education falls in uh, that category. States' rights, uh, that is something that I absolutely fundamentally believe in. Okay. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, just to follow up quickly, you made the comment that you're not being elected king. I, I think um, sometimes the two major party candidates do make it sound like we're electing a king or a queen this and, time and, around. And, and, how, and about, uh, how about eliminating the imperial presidency? Uh, how, many, how many of you have been affected by the president rolling into town and had your traffic snarled for hours and hours and hours? I, I'm not going to do that. So you'd be more of a Jimmy Carter uh, type I'm of gonna president? Be low, I'm going to be low key. I'm going to put on a hat and wear shorts and some sunglasses, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sneak in, and I'm going to sneak out <laughs> okay. to save everybody the hassle of that presidential visit. Okay. And maybe loosen up once in a while. Now, I had to get it in, you know, the Bill Maher, the Bill Maher line. Are you, are you, are you going to light up once in a while or what? No. You know, I, I've always said that um, you should not be on the job impaired, okay? And um, I think running for president is a 24-7 gig. And I think being president is a 24-7 gig also. So count on me, no marijuana consumption as president of the United States. Okay. Yes, sir. My name is Fred Amiri. Good to see you again, Governor. Good to see you, Fred. Uh, I am a very serious conservative Republican. I'm an alternate member of the Central Committee of the Republican Party here in Orange County. I agree with a lot of uh, your fiscal issues. Uh, but when it comes to the social issues, even though I'm kind of in the middle, and uh, I believe in some of the things you say from a social point of view, with a caveat, uh, some of them I have a problem with. One of them is that your party is kind of famous for being atheists. What is your answer to that, and how can you respond to that? Because as you know, this country, the founding fathers were all religious people in a sense. Okay. And I think they 
our religion in this country, the majority of the religion in this country, is one of the strong base of, of our social ethics. Well, uh, I was raised a Christian. Um, I believe in God. Um, I believe that um, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. But I also believe in an absolute separation of church and state. Okay. Okay. Do we have another question? Um, hello, I'm David Schwartzman. I'm a student at Hillsdale College. I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the future of the Libertarian Party beyond you, just on the grassroots level? Uh, I think that this cycle could be the end of the Republican Party. That's what I'm believing. Um, I'm believing that most Americans are Libertarian. It's just that they don't know it. and. Uh, I think beyond this cycle, I think you could actually see that transpire. Okay, thank you. That was, I, I almost want to stop and pause there for a moment when, when, when you say that. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty profound. Uh, I think that Donald Trump alienates more than half of Republicans, and um, I think that you're seeing that uh, play out. And um, we'll see if it really so does. So I'll tell you what, that being the case, why isn't Rand Paul? endorsing you? Why isn't Ron Paul endorsing you? Well, uh, the two of them are socially conservative, and that's okay. It's okay to be a social conservative, but just don't force me into your beliefs. So you think that's the only reason that they wouldn't uh, be... Well, uh, they've chosen to run as Republicans, and that's their choice. Libertarians, look, libertarians don't want to tell anybody what to do, nor do they want to be told what to do. So I'm not going to tell Rand and Ron Paul what they should or shouldn't do, but, uh, but look, Rand Paul, Ron Paul, they wanted to build a fence across the border. Uh, I don't want to build a fence across the border. I think immigration is something that we should embrace. I don't want to uh, kill the families of Muslim terrorists. I'm free market. That means not forcing Apple to make their iPads and their iPhones in the United States and not applying a 35% tariff when it comes to imported goods. There's something for starters. There. And once again, that statement, something for everybody to say, I like that, I don't like that. Sure, it's just, yeah. sure. Well, isn't that what most of us are? I mean, I think but libertarians But very few politicians are, say that. Most of them will tell, they kind of gauge the audience and tell them what they think they want to hear. Well, and right or wrong, uh, I, I've been very well served by saying the same things in front of any audience, regardless of the audience. And I do think that that is the makeup of most people that, look, we're not going to agree on everything, but we can civilly ag agree to disagree. How about a smile on the face? How about, <laughs> how about, some, how about some statesmanship in this whole thing? You may, you're not going to agree with everything I say. Okay. And here's a good friend of mine who always has a smile on his face. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> Governor, thank you so much for coming. I uh, really appreciate the run. I wonder if you could just... But would you just say who you are? Oh, I'm sorry. Or are you I'm make me friend. say who you are? <laughs> yeah, Go sure. ahead. Go that ahead. guy's friend. <laughs> Will Swaim. I work with California Policy Center. Um, thinking back to your days as governor, I wonder, and to Bill Weld, your running mate's uh, time as governor as well, I wonder if you would tell us what you think about the appropriate role of government unions, of public employee unions. They have tremendous, of course financial power, and then they're sort of in a position, not sort of, they are in a position, certainly in California, to fund the elections of people who are then in a position to vote on their pay and benefits. Could you talk about that at the federal level and perhaps even at the local level? Well, uh, I happen to agree with uh, everything it is that you're saying. In New Mexico, uh, um, collective bargaining, uh, collective bargaining uh, um, sunsetted. In New Mexico, I allowed it to sunset, even though there was legislation to reinstitute it. Um, as an entrepreneur, as someone who employed a thousand people in uh, in the electrical area, pipe fitting area, plumbing area, sheet metal, um, I was a real target when it comes to the unions. And let me say this about members of the union uh, and the problem that I have with unions. The problem that I have with unions is, is that I get the best employees that I have ever had that, that I know belong to the union. And I was not a union shop, I was a merit shop. But the best employees ever that belong to the union. Also, the worst employees that I've ever had that belong to the union. 
if I were a union member, I couldn't pay the best employee that I had more money, and I couldn't get rid of the worst employee that I ever had, because as a union member, everyone gets treated equal, and everybody's not equal. So that's the issue that I have with unions. But you know, the argument there is that these people need that protection because if it's left to the business person, you will just exploit the whole group. Well, and the model for the future that I see is, is Uber everything, uh, eliminating the middleman, allowing for me as the person, as the electrician, uh, delivering direct my direct goods and services to the end user, that I'm going to be able to make more money uh, with the Uber model, and the consumer is going to end up paying less money uh, on the receiving end of that. So uh, really, I, I, the sharing economy, Airbnb, uh, it's exciting. And uh, promoting entrepreneurship, being able to create your own job, being able to create other jobs. And as wonderful as that sounds, other people it will say- It is wonderful. But yes, yes. Okay. But, but <laughs> the, the, uh, the other argument is that some people, I think, have a sense when it comes to libertarians that that's a little bit of the problem. Just a little too much laissez-faire, survival of the fittest, uh, let the weak fall by the wayside. No, How no, do you respond well, to that? Well, I respond to that by saying, okay, so I was actually governor of New Mexico for eight years in a heavily Democrat state, Rick. And did were, the, were there... Were there people starving in the streets? No, actually what people saw was more efficient government because it was being done by fewer people. And Bill Wald would echo this same thing. So the libertarian philosophy in government, how does someone who is small government, Republican, get reelected in a heavily Democrat state? By having well, a big heart. Well, by having a big heart and that then gets to this, gee, if you're in college and you're not a Democrat, you don't have a heart. Uh, and if as an adult, uh, you're not Republican, you don't have a brain, how about the notion that we all have hearts and brains? Yes, and I think this will be our last question. <laughs> all right, hi, thanks for speaking again. Uh, you mentioned during the talk that libertarians are non-interventionists, but you also said that you supported uh, after in 2001 going into Afghanistan. So under what circumstances do you support intervention? And uh, in the future, what would you, what would be your response to that? If, if we're that? attacked, we're going to attack back. And 9-11 was an attack by Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, and that's where they were, and we went after them. And count on me to do the same should something occur in the future. I just need to ask one last question because I think that on the whole list of things we talked about, we didn't really talk very much about the thing that's the number one issue among voters, and that's the economy. In a minute or less, can you give us, when it comes to economy, taxes, what would you do? Well, uh, I'm not going to get elected uh, the dictator. I'm going to get elected as uh, president. So I'm going to uh, count on me to sign any legislation that simplifies taxes, count on me to sign any legislation that lowers taxes. But if I could wave a magic wand, I would eliminate income tax, I would eliminate corporate tax, I would abolish the IRS because there would be no need to have the IRS, and I would replace all of it with one federal consumption tax. In this case, use the fair tax as a template for how you could accomplish that piece of legislation that's pended before Congress for the last 10 years. But if we had no corporate tax, I believe tens of millions of jobs would get created in this country for no other reason than zero corporate tax and I believe that we would issue pink slips to 80% of Washington lobbyists because that's why they're there to garner tax favor. It's for sale uh, and it's being bought. Okay. Guns, we didn't get the guns, but you're Second Amendment. You're a pro-Second Amendment. I am pro-Second Amendment, but come on, let's uh, be open to a discussion about how we potentially keep guns out of the hands of the mentally ill. And well, everybody's for that. Well, everybody is for that. Yes, we should be. And so, you, but you're... Pro-Second Amendment, then. I am so. pro-Second Amendment, yes. Okay. I haven't seen a suggestion that actually does keep guns out of the hands of the mentally ill, nor have I seen a suggestion 
that keeps guns out of the hands of would-be terrorists. But let's okay. let's let's be dynamic here, and let's right. be let, let's have some thinking human beings uh, in office. Well, a Governor, some people may be able to <laughs> say they disagree with you, but I don't think anybody can say <laughs> you're not one thoughtful and accomplished guy. And thanks so much. Let's hear it again. Uh, for thank you. Thank you. Thank you.